Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a second submission by Morelli, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and Anja, who is a uh, Frisian that she's rehabbing. And this is a big improvement over what I saw in the last videotape. Now, however, her body hasn't changed a whole lot yet, but it certainly will if you keep doing what you're doing. So, um, as you said, patience is the hard hardest part of this game at this point, you know. But look how nicely this horse is walking now. This is a big improvement over the horse, over the last time I saw this horse. The horse is swinging much better over its back. And once again, you know, poor Frisians because, uh, you know, almost every one of them, every time I see an overweight rider, they've gone out and bought a Frisian thinking that they're big horses and can carry them. Nothing could be further from the truth. That's why we see so many upside down Frisians. Then, of course, they have this big neck that comes, you know, rather high up out of the body, the way a lot of the most expensive horses do these days. And so they're easy for people to try to cram the, frame, the neck into a frame that they think, as you said, with this horse, someone tried to make it an upper level horse with, you know, who didn't understand how to go about that, that process and uh, ended up having the horse a basket case and upside down and hollow and all the rest of it that you see there. So, you know, what you're doing now, um, just know is going to improve the horse already since the last time I saw you. This is a huge improvement in the walk. Horse is swinging much better over its back. His neck looks uh, like a different horse practically than the... Uh, than what I saw in the last video. Um, having a little trouble bending, she said, and what, what you have to remember is the horse cannot bend laterally until it is working over its back. So if you have a horse that's extremely, uh, wants to bend to the opposite side, this sort of thing, and to one side, that is all the time, wants to always bend to the left, that's just a horse that's extremely stiff and just hasn't gotten all the way over its back because that's what allows the bend to happen. So to try to bend a horse uh, actively try to bend a horse that is, isn't over his back just leads to a great deal of frustration on the part of the horse and the rider because the horse literally physically can't do it. Once you understand that, you'll stop frustrating yourself and your horses by trying to bend them when they're not bent longitudinally. The horse must lift its back. That's what frees the spine and allows it to bend from side to side. So as I said, this is probably the biggest thing that creates so much um, confusion in riders but once you understand this one simple rule, the horse can't bend until it lifts up its back. Then it can bend, and bend becomes very easy. It's like once you get a horse over its back, it feels like all of a sudden, wow, there's power steering on. But even this horse, compared to the last time I saw it, this is a huge improvement. If you go back and look at your last video, this horse is just swinging much better over its back. It's much more consistent, and its neck shape has changed quite a bit. So already you've done a great deal for this horse and it's going to continue. But remember when you have a horse like this, you know, that spent however many years it spent, you know, to get in the shape that it was in when you got it and the years of bad training and the back has started down, you know, it's going to take a while. It's going to take at least a year to bring the back back up. And then, so in other words, it may take a little longer than a normal horse. So a horse that you start a baby, it takes two years to put a foundation on. Now, interestingly enough, though, I don't think it, it usually does not take much more than that. It seems to be about the same amount of time, unless the horse is, you know, really, really got a, you know, or a severely injured back, as say the horse uh, that we have Bailador was. I mean, his back was so bad he had holes all the way down to the bone on his back in the shape of a saddle or a bad fitting saddle had fit on him. So it took a long time, it took two years to get that horse over his back. But that's what it takes sometimes. That stallion Contigo that we had took a few years also because he had bad feet. So we had to deal with the feet problem. You know, we couldn't get enough work in him to get everything going. But now we do. And it was well worth the time. And it'll be well worth the time with this one. I don't see anything wrong with this horse other than the fact that it's just back has dropped. So once again, you've got to remember that Frisians were really not intended to be riding horses. They're intended to be carriage horses, you know, and they're bred up from draft horses and things. So you know, they were never intended to have riders on them that much. And people are trying to show them a lot these days in riding. You know, and once again, if you train them really correctly, you can get there. But if you just get on them, especially if you're a big, heavy person, you know, they're so long in the back anyway. So they're prone to being, have being weak in the back. Once again, remember, just because the horse is big doesn't mean that its back is strong. In fact, it's just that polar opposite. You know, the bigger the horse is, we think it's going to be stronger. But in fact, the bigger they are, the weaker their backs are because the weight of their own body after a certain size, like the size of a Frisian, you know, the weight of their own belly starts pulling them down. So that's why it's also important that we don't overfeed Frisians and these kind of horses that, that we need to get some of the weight off. You know, we keep them a little bit on the lean side because, of course, all that extra weight can do damage. But even looking at this horse's belly, now it still has a little bit of that pregnant mare look about it. The the, uh, the flanks there a little bit still come out and, the, and she's dropped further in the belly than I'd like her to be. But it's better than it was in the last video. Um, so this is a big improvement. 
And once again, even if you did nothing but do this walk, the horse would improve and you'd be able to put muscle on it, even if you never went into a trot, just doing this. And of course, that would be the rule. If you can't get the horse over its back and moving correctly in the trot, don't do it. I mean, you certainly try it, but if you, know, if you can't get the horse stretching within you know, a few minutes, really, uh, you know, five minutes, let's say, or something like that, or it's probably time to go back to the walk because we just don't want to spend a lot of time doing things in the wrong way. That's the biggest problem. So many people in training horses today, they think, oh, you've got to walk, trot, and canter the horse every day, or it's not any good. But nothing could be further from the truth. You just don't want to do anything with the horse not working over its back. That's how we preserve the soundness of the horse. Just remember, it's like a car. If you drive the car without shocks on, the whole car will vibrate and fall apart. Well, that's exactly what happens to horses that aren't working over the backs. And of course, the reason we see so many discarded, beautiful young horses that, you know, even six and seven years old already being discarded, you know. It's kind of like the show ring has now become like the racetrack is and still is that, you know, for all the hundreds of them that try to get there, there's only a few of them that actually even get to the track. Well, the same thing is true with the showing world, you know, that, you know, so many of them have a very short career, even those who win a great deal and all of a sudden uh, they're gone. Totalist being a perfect example of that and uh, uh, definitely a cautionary tale for anybody thinking about investing in horses. Um, you know, it's just not good unless you, you know, really get the horses to enjoy the work. And if you take that away from them, it's all going to go downhill very quickly. And it does. But what you're doing here is going to get this horse going up the hill <laughs> and in a very good way here. So everything I've seen here so far today has been a big improvement of what I saw in the last one. This walk is swinging and active. And once again, she's riding in the shambone, and that's perfectly fine. Now, you can see the shambos is adjusted so that the horse can still get its head above the withers if it wanted to. So once again, that's a safety issue. Um, now, we did see how there was another uh, video that is uh, that came in that somebody was using a shambo that has a piece that keeps it from getting too low in front. And that's sometimes a good idea too, if the shambo ends up getting down low enough, hanging low enough that the horse could get a foot in it, then we certainly wouldn't want to ride it that way, but we'd want to put a, an easy cure for that with, with a horse like you have here would be just to put a stirrup leather around the horse's neck so that the shambo goes up and through that a little bit. Just be sure it's really loose if you do that. And that would, if you had, you know, if it were so loose that you had a danger of the horse stepping into it as it, as it moves, which is something to think about. Good leg yield here, very good rhythm, stayed very nicely over her back in that. And once again, this is such a better picture. So just remember, keep all your turns very wide until this horse just gets stronger. So once again, I wouldn't expect this horse to be, over, you know, her belly is still down a little bit. She hasn't really come all the way up through the back, but you've certainly made big and big uh, strides in that direction. And what you're doing here will lead to that, will lead to, you know, building enough muscle that the horse will not only lose the sort of uh, hollowness that it has in its back, it will come up flat. But remember what also has to happen is in this period of time, in that two year period, and this has to happen with every horse, no matter it's three years old or, or it's five years old, is that the correct work actually brings the withers up out of the shoulders and really flattens that place just behind the saddle and brings it up underneath you so that you have a really good place to sit. Remember, if your saddle is fitting correctly, you should be sitting in, at the strongest point of the horse's back, which is just at the base of the withers, which is where we want to want our primary weight to be. The closest you come to the withers, the less movement in the horse. So it's also easier to sit because there's not so much upward thrust in the back of that position. Whereas the further back you get, if you have a horse that's working up to its back, it's going to feel bouncier back there. Once again, that's the reason we see so many Americans go to Europe to try jumping horses and get jumped out of the saddle. I've seen numerous people have that happen to them because they, they're trying to jump in the American style of getting up on the neck. And then the horse is jumping through its back. It's going to jump you right out of the saddle. So starting off in the trot here, but this horse is really nice and active. And what a beautiful mover this horse is. Not quite really um, completely consistently over its back yet, and therefore not connecting from front to back. But this horse is going, certainly going to be a beautiful mover. You know, and what I like about this one is she, some of the Frisians are just so enormous, and they just really kind of look clunky. But uh, this one looks like it may turn out to be quite a nice riding horse. Certainly has an ability to reach under itself. And once again, you can see it hollowing there and getting unecked. And that was just the thing to do, come back to the walk. So basically what I saw right there was the horse is not quite ready to do much, much stretching work in the trot yet. Now, I'm not sure that you're still lunging the horse, but of course that's where we can also, you know, if you have your horse that is too weak to be able to trot correctly with you on its back, it probably should be doing some lunge work. Uh, in the shambone so that it can develop that strength without you up there. 
So we'd cer certainly want to do that. Um, you know, a horse for me that, you know, with me, that is as uh, a little over the back as this one is yet, I would be certainly be lunging it probably every day were it I. Now, remember when I talk about lunging, I'm not talking about lunging horses for 45 minutes at a time. I'm talking about doing a five to 10 minute warm up on each side. Just take it to the horse swinging an actor over its back before we get up on top of it. So just something to think about as you build the strength. If you find that you know, you can't just get on and ride and get the trot. You may want to start doing a little more trot on the lunge line with the horse, getting the horse stretching into the contact to help it build strength there. But I certainly like everything that I've seen here in the walk. And once again, you did just the right thing of just coming back. So here we try the trot again. I will say the horse, however, is moving better in this video than it was the last time. Even the trot work here, while still not exactly where I want it to be. There we go. Now she starts to stretch a little bit for you. You know, in just that moment, the horse even stretched that little bit farther down. If you go back and look at that tape, just all of a sudden, she started to look more balanced. That is, she was able to bring the hind leg through at the same level of, as the front leg. Now, we can see here she's a little, high, little hollow here. We see the hind leg as it goes back. It's still on the ground too, full, too long, going behind the body. So that's what happens with a hollow horse, and that's also what, what happens to their hocks. If they push too far behind the body, it kind of destroys all those little bones inside the hock. So we wouldn't want to do that for a long period of time. But this is certainly looking better, and the horse is developing a little more push off the ground. And it certainly looks better in this direction than the other. And just as you said, it may be like almost impossible in the other direction. Once you get the stretch on this side to get all the way there, once again, we get it in both directions. We get the horse back to lift. You'll find that the, the, the uh, bends will become very easy. So that was a much better trot work there, exactly what you want to see. That was an improvement over what I saw on the other side. But it, and it also was not too much. It wasn't enough that I would have wanted to keep doing it for, for much longer. It was a good test, and the horse showed that it was getting there, and it certainly, once again, looks better than the last video that I saw of it. But this is exactly the right thing to do. Instead of trying to fight the horse in that trot to try to improve it, you never improve anything by fighting with horses about whatever it is that you're doing. That never improves anything. You know, so many people that you see ride like that, as you described how this horse had been ridden, we see every day at so-called dressage schools where these people are trying to force horses into a frame. If you don't understand how a horse develops and over it and how it must develop over its back to be a dressage horse, you really don't know anything about dressage. All you're doing is just another person blindly trying to force horse to force horses to do something that they don't understand. And really, it's even worse when we talk about dressage than it is even in saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers. I mean, that's basically what you're doing to a horse when you cram it into a frame is the same thing that the gated horse people are doing. They're doing it even to a little more extent. But you notice that they don't do any lateral work. All they do is go around and around. And when you see them school at home, they school up and down a barn aisle. They go straight down a barn aisle, then they come back to a halter walk and turn around and come straight back the other way. Because you know, with, with hollow horses, it destroys their legs to do lateral work. So once again, why we see so many of these so-called dressage horses today ending their careers so young, because once again, you know, at least the saddlebred people just go in a straight line where with, with their hollow horses. But bad dressage riders are asking them to do all these other movements and the lateral movements, which puts so much tension, you know, and strain on those little joints of the horse's leg. If the horse isn't over its back, it should not be doing lateral movements, you know, other than that little bit of, you know, leg yield that helps us to get the horse over its back. When it does, then we, then we can begin lateral work in earnest. But until then, we certainly should be staying away from it. That is until the horse is working over its back. So she's certainly come back to a good walk here once again. It has moments where it comes up a little bit. It's a little more less active than it was um, in the first part here. So this horse is beginning to look a little tired to me because step is not as active. You see how in that leg yield it, it begins to be a, a little more tired and she's starting to, to stretch a little less here. So I want to get her back out in front of us again like that. See that, that once again. See how the difference when it was up high, the hind leg is, it looks like it's stuck in mud. The lower you go, the more it looks like it's able to just swing forward like there. And we take the step because to be active and rhythmic. So you can see how to do those shortened step. And once again, that's how horses get. Like if you look at this horse when it comes around, how the top of its croup there is just like a, you know, it's been worked in a very short um not worked in its full length all the time. You see, go right there. So that's a horse that's been worked in very shortened gates its whole life with a drop back. That's how they end up with 
people used to call that a hunter's bump. As I said, it's nothing more than, you know, a badge of dishonor. It just really means a bad riding bump. It means a horse that's been trained incorrectly its whole life and never been allowed to develop its top line. That's what it looks like. So just know, however, that if you keep doing this work, the horse will change shape. Now, here as the work has gone on, we can take a look at the belly here and see that the belly has come up a little bit. So she's beginning to draw up through her uh, abdominal wall there, and that's exactly what we're looking for her to do. As I said, she does look like she's starting to get a little tired now. Remember, these big horses tire out quite quickly as well, so it's hard to do a great deal with them until they uh, gain a little more physical strength. And always remember that physical strength is not the same thing as aerobic fitness. You know, it's very easy. People always make that mistake with hot horses of getting them very aerobically fit because they lunge them to wear them out instead of to train them. So if you do that, they just become fitter and fitter and fitter. And before long, they've got a horse that's hollow, but it, you know, can run five miles. And of course, his legs fall off after they do it. So once again, this is a better trot here coming back this time. Starting to see a little improvement in the stretch here. The hind legs are beginning to get off the ground quicker. That is, they're coming forward sooner. Like, that looks pretty good right there. Now, that was a couple of moments there where the horse was the best I've seen it yet today. And that was a good place to stop as well because it was the best stop place. So let's reward the horse for getting there. You know, once again, one of the most important things to remember is that you want to reward anything, anytime the horse does anything better than it's ever done before. Even As far as I'm concerned, even if the horse has only been in the ring for five minutes, I stop or just take it for a walk because... You know, if you make a breakthrough, you, you want you want to really impress that on the mind of the horse. And remember that, you know, getting off and giving it a sugar, you know, is the best thing you can do for the horse. It, it's no reward for the horse to go now take a mile-long trail ride. That's not a reward for the horse. Yes, they may seem relaxed out there. I see bad dressage riders saying that all the time. Oh, I take my horse out to relax them. Well, you should be relaxing them in the ring. And then, uh, you know, the work is very similar. But they, I see bad riders say, oh, my horse just loves to walk, us to go out for a trail ride. And of course, they do because they go out there and the people leave them alone because now the person is a tourist and they're just kind of just sitting using the horse as a means of transport to one to the other. But they're not trying to cram it into a false frame with like they, like they try to do in the so-called dressage ring. So once again, this is a really good walk here. Much, much better. And if we go back and see this horse uh, in the previous video, you would see that this is m much improved. I really think you're well on your way. And once again, look how the abdominal wall has pulled up a little here by this time. But I think that was about it for the horse. I begin to see feel like she was getting a little tired when we came back to that last walk. Even here, she's looking a little tired here. So remember, these are big horses. And in order to work over their backs, and unfortunately, you know, the the back muscle, which needs to be, you know, 80% of the horse is now only 5% of the horse. So, and that's what's tiring out. So we want to work that top line is the only thing that we're interested in is developing the top line. When we do that and get the horse stretch over its back, magically everything else takes care of itself. And once again, coming back to the trot here. I like how you're just keeping the big circle. I am seeing a little better stretch each time, so that's a little better. Flowing a little more actively. I think what you want to do right about there is just ask the horse to slow down now a little bit. You do get the feel of it. Of course, you, know, you touch the reins as I see you do there, and all of a sudden the horse just stalls out. So if that's the case, it's better to keep them moving a little quicker than, than we might like. But once again, just don't do much of this. I still feel like this trot is a little too disconnected to do a lot of it. You're having moments when it's really good, and that was exactly right. Just as the horse started to come together there, you brought it back to a walk. That's exactly what we want to do, reward her for softening. And if we do that for long, the horse will be very willing to do the things that we ask it to do. So that was really a great workout for this horse. I see a huge improvement. You're riding it very well. Good use of the shambone. Everything is going very, very well here, and you are right on the right track. So just stick with it, and you will see this horse change. That's why it's good to do these videos. And, you know, the reason that I, I thought to do this system that we're doing here, because this gives everybody working with us, you know, a, uh, a wonderful library of their own work that they can go back and see how much they've done. And, of course, and the reason I do these, these inex inexpensively like this is so everyone can get the benefit of everyone else's 
work and their try and how everyone is trying to do the same thing. But once again, look how achievable it is. You don't have to be the greatest rider in the world, you know, to learn how to get a horse over its back and develop it. You know, but and the beauty is that once you do, it improves your riding because you you can't hang on the horse and ride in this manner. You know, so your own balance will develop, your legs will lengthen down the side of the horse all by themselves. Kind of like we would like to do you know, if we had school horses that, you know, advanced school horses that we could lunge people on, but most people don't have that these days. If they do have school horses, they're mostly broken down ones with a hollow back that aren't worth getting on. So this is the best thing I've found in order to get there. So looking at the back here, while she still looks a little thin, there's not a whole lot of top line on there. I do think the back looks less dropped than the last time I saw it. Now see how that hip comes up there? That's what we're talking about, how it cuts off at the top. If this horse had continued down the road it was on, it would have ended up with kissing spine. That's the first sign of it right there when you see that lump that comes up to the spine. So, But just know that all that will improve over the next year or so, and you'll see all that change. The withers will pull up to the shoulders. And this horse will change dramatically from what it is now. But you've done a very, very good job, though. Keep up the good work. And once again, just keep the patience. Know that if you're on track, even if all you're doing is walking, if you get the horse over its back, the horse will improve. And the next time it will be better. So you literally could do that for a long, long time once you understand that walk work. As long as it takes, because you have to. Once again, standing here, we can see in silhouette how it's only the bottom part of the neck where this horse has any muscle, which is where we don't want it to be. But once again, I do see a better a better lift in the back here than I saw the last time. This is Will Faber from March to Ride. See you soon.